So you want to tell me, uh, maybe before, kind of before we get started, you want to tell me maybe a little bit more about yourself? Because, I mean, we just <laughs> kind of ran into each other via sure. a, an uh, extended comment thread, right? Yeah. I, is this already recording? Yeah. I mean, I, I, can, I can begin the, the actual, like, listenable part of, of this conversation whenever. So, I mean, oh. w- whenever it seems like it's a good spot to that it would be interesting to start listening, that's usually where I edit it. So, it... <laughs> You can, okay, so you just want me to just tell you about just myself in general? Yeah, I, well, I mean, specifically in regards to like we, we were talking a little bit about like libertarianism, and you were talking about this this guy Proudhon. Is it Proudhorn? Proudhon? Proudhon. Proudhon. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> French. Yeah. Which I should know how to say that. I mean, I, I live here in in Canada, and but I I didn't ever actually learn do you, how to do, do, you do speak it French? Much French. No, I don't. You don't. Do you have friends that speak French there? Yeah, I mean, I have friends that know how to speak French. I don't really have, I don't know too many people where where French is their first language. Yeah, because it's it's mostly limited to like Montreal, Quebec. Even in Montreal, everybody there speaks English. Basically, if if you speak French badly there, they're just going to start speaking English to you and kind of (laughs) scoff. Interesting. Where where are Um, you from, actually? From me? I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Born and raised south. Funnily enough, I actually went to school in Concord, North Carolina. What? That's crazy. I grew up in Charlotte. You know, it touches on Concord. I grew up really close to Concord. Why were you in Concord? <laughs> well, uh, I I grew up in really uh, kind of hyper religious circles. <laughs> so that's you know Charlotte is known for that. It's I a mean, it's a hub. To, yeah. Billy well, Graham was from here. You know, right? this is. We bring in evangelicals across. Exactly. So this, this was Our it was like tourist attraction is the Billy Graham Library. Yeah, and I mean, I think I've been there a couple, like three or four different times. <laughs> I've never <laughs> been there. I didn't even really know what's in it. I mean, it's not an actual library, is it? I don't it's know. it's kind of weird. It's it's almost like a, it's like part museum, part sort of like exhibit like kind of experience. I don't know. It's it's very much like you know, there's a gift shop and there's like little displays and. And some historical stuff. It's it's kind of very interactive. So it's like kind of, I, I, it's almost like marketed to homeschoolers, which is. <laughs> uh, I can see that we get a lot of them here. Is it is there an actual library? That's my key question. I've always wanted to know. There, I mean, if there is, it's it's hidden away. It's not. I mean, there's a bookstore, but it's. Just, <laughs> it, I don't think it's really a a library uh, like, of, I don't know, like a traditional library. Maybe, maybe there is one. I I didn't. I don't remember seeing one. So you came to Concord for how long? Just a little bit? Yeah, I was in Concord for, uh, well, my, my sister lived there. Um, so I, I, I lived with her for, for part of the time I was there, part of the time I was living with another family. But yeah, I was I, I was trying to finish a three-year program at like a, a ministry school, kind of missions-focused ministry school. Didn't mm-hmm. actually get to finish the entire uh degree there actually because since it wasn't it's not a um what do you say um like a recognized school it's not a right it's not it's not, a, it's not a, accredited accredited yeah. yeah so because it wasn't accredited i wasn't even able to to get across the border to finish it after a certain point they're like hey you don't have a u.s citizenship you, we're not gonna let you go across the border so i, fi- oh. I finished the program online huh um, are there many is it very evangelical and Canada? No. But you're just kind of like an odd Yeah. Don't fit into the background, I guess. Well, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I mean, there's definitely uh, a bunch of evangelicals locally like in in Paris, Ontario, which is kind of where where my my mom's parents lived growing up and where I, where I currently am right now. This is where my parents live. Um and yeah, there, there's like there's a there's a small community. It's, it, Canada at large isn't it, it isn't generally as Christian as the United States, or specific, especially as evangelical. But right. um, we happen to just be on that wave, and so I mean, my grandparents had a whole like uh, traveling family band thing they did for for years, and mm-hmm. that was actually like a, like a Christian one, a religious one. Exactly. Yeah, they they went around to, to assemblies of God churches churches and. Um, and Salvation Armies and anything. So, I mean, Salvation Army isn't quite evangelical. I mean, it's similar tradition, but not quite the same, right? There's a lot of, yeah, 
that was kind of where where I came from is just like deep involvement with that and like so I mean I spent a lot of time in the states growing up with with being part of that because I mean that was literally like I used to be on tour for the first 17 years in my life first 10 years probably I was uh on the tour with my grandparents and then the next seven wow. years my grandparents retired and it was like my parents and we still had this traveling ministry thing that was very focused on like you know preaching and and spreading the good very news like Protestant yeah background. yeah exactly so I mean, I'm, I'm used to that, man. There's tons of that here. I mean, Charlotte is just like a hub for all kind of these preachers who put down like a little thing on the ground. They stand on it and they preach. Yeah. A lot I... of them are fucking assholes, to be honest. A lot of them are <laughs> at the university where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, there's usually, there, there used to be at least always one of the, what they call like uh they're just preachers but there's they typically i forgot what we used to call them but they just they'll just demean people you know like yeah. you know you're going to hell you know you're slut you know they say like the meanest things to people and it's yeah. like, they, yeah. there's so many different variants of christianity yeah. that's what one thing about the religion i've always found very interesting yeah for sure okay let Do me you... tell you about myself okay yeah yeah tell me a little bit more about where you come from <clears throat> so uh my name's case Emil, um, born and raised in Charlotte. Uh, I think it's not that much. Okay, in terms of religious background, uh, my father comes from, he's from the Middle East. And so he's actually, he was raised Muslim, but he's like not religious. Okay. Uh, my mother is from the South. She is like that typical Protestant, Southern Baptist kind of upbringing, but she really isn't religious. She just has like, you know, these little things she thinks you got to do in order to get into heaven. You know, she doesn't really know the story okay. that well. But she just knows, OK, you just got to say that, you know, Jesus is the whatever, you know. Right. OK. A bunch of like for her, a bunch of dogma, but whatever. When I was growing up, they took me to Unitarian Universalist Church. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's kind of like open to all religions. OK. So. We would, you know, one week we would have black Muslims come, you know, the one nation of Islam. And then the other weeks we'd have different kinds of Christianity sects come. Mm-hmm. I was always like thinking about religion and philosophy growing up. Uh, and then I went to, when I was in high school, when I was in ninth grade, Charlotte actually has a history of mandatory busing where we brought kids from the suburb, brought them into like, try to desegregate neighborhoods. Um, I went through that until ninth grade. Actually, I was getting bullied pretty bad when I was in ninth grade. My parents mm-hmm. took me out. And I went, my dad, because he's from the Middle East, over there, they think of Christian schools, private schools, as like very prestigious. Hmm. He just stuck me in a school that he knew other people were in. And it was like cult. I mean, it was like... I mean, I hated it. It was a nightmare for me. Um, so I went three years in that. Uh, and then I got out. I stopped really caring about religion. Um, and then I, I, mean, I, I don't know how much you want to know. What do you well, want to know? Yeah, well, what you shared so far, that's great. Can you kind of take me to where you are? I mean, so it's just interesting when you talk about politics you end up discussing ideals, which are, I mean, whether or not you want to call that religious or not is up to you. But like there, there's, there's some sort of a narrative of, of kind of beginning to appreciate different views on, on ethics and morality and like what should be right. And, and sure. so, I mean, you're obviously very interested in politics and I, I, I read one of your articles, um, about Proudhon and, uh, did I say that right this time? Proudhon, yeah, you got yeah, okay. it. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so, I mean, how, how did you get to where you are no, now and kind of where you're interested in now? Okay. Um, well, it's kind of difficult to tell. All right, so like I said, my dad's from the Middle East. He's from Baghdad. Um, came here in 78. All his family was over there. The Iraq War, when I was a kid, was like big. I mean, I was 16 when the second Iraq War started. So it was something that made me real like sensitive to politics immediately, like very young. 
Right. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know if you're familiar with Noam Chomsky. I, he I've heard his name so many times, but I, I haven't gone and familiarized myself with him too much. He, okay, well, he's known as a, a linguist and, you know, from MIT. That's what he got famous from. Then he's also like this political dissident and like he's very into foreign policy, okay. very against the United States foreign policy. And so when I was a kid, that really made sense to me. The things he was saying, like, you know, the United States should not be involved in Iraq and should not be involved in you know, trying to get rid of Saddam. And like, and so I got real into him because when I was, that was around the time I started to go into university, UNC Charlotte is where I went. I was a history undergrad. I always was like, and I would take Middle Eastern courses and stuff like that about like the history of the region and stuff. And it always felt to me like they knew that we shouldn't be in Iraq. That for me was just like the ultimate question because I had family over there and it was just, and so I just dug into Chomsky more and more. And if you get into Chomsky, you learn, oh, he's into the anarchist tradition. And hmm. so that was my first introduction to anarchist thought was through Chomsky. You know, most of it is just people, you know, oh, I'm so badass, you know, I, no laws, no rules, you know. <laughs> but then there's actually like a true literary movement, like uh, actual books and people have written and there's a whole, and it, basically if you get into it, I, my entrance is through Chomsky, is that they, it was very lively up until like the 1930s and then it just dropped off the mm. face of the earth. And then it really only started coming back up until now. There's been this whole tradition of anarchist thinkers and stuff like that who people have just not read, just not kept up with. Right. Yeah, I, I so, remember recently listening to Michael Malice a little bit talking about some of this stuff and talking about how he wants to kind of combi compile some of the, the literary tradition associated with, with um, anarchy and stuff because it's, it's I guess, kind of harder to track down now. You still there, Case? All right, I don't know what happened. All right, not not sure what happened there, but sorry, I I think I lost you. I was I was saying saying I had heard Michael Malice talking a little bit about about Michael Mal Michael Malice Malice. I'm not familiar. Okay, I, well, so, I, you, you probably I, I I imagine that you would be because he's like one of the kind of the big um, loud advocates for anarchy right now. Um, and he's kind of doing the rounds of different podcasts and stuff. Of that stuff nowadays. I okay. Mean, well, no, he... Okay. This is this is what I'll tell you. So through Chomsky, I got into anarcho syndicalism, which is like now what people are into, which is like. So can you say that again? Anar anarchist whatism? Anarcho syndicalism. Syndicalism. Basically, okay. it just what it really it's what Chomsky would say he was. Okay. Or is he still alive? He's like ninety one or two now. Yeah. But it's. It's basically like, okay, like, let's get the unions. To, everybody needs to get in a union, like general unions, and they need to go out and strike, and we need to have general strikes, and we need to put the pressure on in order to take over companies and for the companies to become more owned by the workers. That really appealed to me, you know, when I was, like, yeah. growing up. Because a lot of the problems I saw in the world seemed to be from, like, corporate America, big business. So to me, that made a lot of sense. And that's what Chomsky was saying, you know. And through Chomsky, I started reading some of the people he was referring to, like Rudolf Rocker, who is an anarcho-syndicalist. And then I got into, like, Bakunin. And Bakunin is, is old school. I mean, he's like the 1800s Russia militant. His idea is, like, he was very, like, anti-God altogether. I mean, he was like, God is, is when he said God's evil, he's literal. Like, he, yeah. he's saying, like, okay. Well, God's kind of the ultimate institution, right? <laughs> Exactly. In God's the ultimate authority. You know, mm -hmm. God is the judge upstairs who says, you're going to go to hell and you're going to go to heaven. Like, mm -hmm. I judge. Everything's black and white, you know. And so Bakunin is saying, like, look, I mean, this is what you guys think is good. Is this judge up here? This is not good. Okay. The opposite <laughs> of this is good. Okay. He's saying, like, right. fuck God. And, and you'll see in his writings, like, he assumes Proudhon is this way. Proudhon is the one before Bakunin. Okay. He assumes that Proudhon, he, he had met Proudhon in person. And, you know, a lot of people consider Bakunin to be like 
to take the torch from Proudhon. Okay. In reality, Proudhon is actually there's the legend of Proudhon is this militant crazy guy. The reality is, as he got older, he seemed to mature. Whatever. That that's basically where I was when I was younger. Later on, I got pulled into more like pro market discussions, more like gradualist discussions that weren't about militancy or about force or about or about like finding an economic alternative was basically what it became. And what I eventually learned was this was exactly what Proudhon had written to begin with. He was always and this only I only learned about Proudhon maybe like four years ago or so. Hmm. Um, and it's really like a revival that's been going on. He is a person who has been totally forgotten. To like even among anarchists, they don't know anything about Proudhon. Hmm. The only thing they'll tell you is, oh, isn't that guy against women? Like he's a misogynist. And partly that is true. There's a book that came out when he died that was like terrible about women. Yeah, but, exactly. uh, <laughs> he, he wrote so so many books i mean you're talking about a guy if you can't even understand this guy was just writing his entire life right um his work and it's just fascinating stuff i mean he grew up very poor in france and uh he became a printer when he was like 18 and apparently where he was from all he was printing was like theological publications and he was saying like by before he was like 18 or something the only thing he had read was like like the Bible and like one other thing. He was just someone who was immersed in the particularly Catholic tradition of France. And this is right after the French Revolution. Um, I, I guess I was supposed to tell you about me, but well, no, I that's mean, I mean, we, we've got to the core of I mean, this is you, you told me about you up to this point, and then we started talking about your ideas, and then we started talking about kind of this, this central figure that's obviously been of interest to you recently and so so what uh, why are you so particularly drawn i mean you said that he kind of some some of the places you were landing are where he seemed to have been the whole time and so what what were those kind of you know uh, aha moments oh. that kind of said oh this is the guy so there's many things one it goes back to your point you said in the beginning which was like how politics ties in to morality and ideals and Proudhon is he's a he's this guy who really is saying that like everything's connected here I mean this your your views on politics connects to your views of morality your I mean it's life is very complex the other key thing I'll say about Proudhon is that when you're looking for creative thought in general you want to look at networks you want to see who, like, okay, I'll, let me backtrack. Proudhon was around a lot of, he was, you know, Marx, Karl Marx, everybody knows Karl Marx. Yeah. He met with Proudhon, and Proudhon was the big figure back then. And then he also met with Auguste, Auguste, Auguste Comte. He's, this, he, he's the figure that started sociology. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's also my background is in sociology. Okay. I was a sociology grad student at UNC Charlotte. Um, yeah, he, Proudhon, and a lot of sociologists in France have written about the significance of his work for sociology. He was actually a major influence on Emile Durkheim. Durkheim became a huge influence within sociology and probably is the biggest figure today in sociology. But it, people do not know that Proudhon was key influence on Durkheim. And this, I've written about this. That's why I, I can yeah. see this. Well, um, so can you kind of go into the, like, like, obviously it sounds like this guy has some, some important ideas, but w what, what are some of the key, you know, problems or questions that we're struggling with right now that, you, that Proudhon seemed to have, have the answers to, or like, what, why does, okay. why does his ideas seem so interesting to you right now? Yeah. Um, I think that when a lot of people look at society today, they don't really see it going in a good direction. Like, it seems like things are breaking down, something wrong, you know, like this is not sustainable. Um, but not many people have a good answer. 
How many people can tell you, like, ooh, okay, this is what needs to be fixed? <clears throat> I think Proudhon, what Proudhon really did is basically, like, invert the Bible, more or less. That, hmm. That's really what his work is, and that's really why he's kind of, like, a, Can you unpack that a little bit? What, what do you mean by, like, inverting sure. the Bible? Sure, okay, well, we can, so, I can go through the whole story, if you'd like. Sure. He okay, has great. This, so Auguste Comte, he's known for the, the law of three stages. He says, oh, okay, every field goes through the theological phase, the metaphysical phase, and the scientific phase. Mm. He shows us in all kinds of fields. So it starts with religion, then it goes to speculation, and then it eventually goes to uh, demonstration. I'm going to show you that this is what works. Okay. And, and Comte's big thing was, once we do this for the study of society, then we'll have an entire encyclopedia of scientific thought and we'll be able to reconstruct society. That's, you know, then Marx came along and said, that's utopia. And he's right to some degree. Proudhon though, had this idea of what he called the three revolutions of justice. He's not really the law of three stages, but it's very similar. Um, so what his whole thing was, I can tell you the whole, it's a big, long spiel. So, uh, I don't, this is me speculating here. I, th I, Proudhon didn't say this. Yeah. You take the Bible and you look at the first story, Adam and Eve, right? The story portrayed is that, okay, look, humans have this great place. You know, it's like, it's perfect. Heaven on earth, you know? But humans wreck it. Okay, humans fuck it up. That's basically the story. That's really how I see Proudhon seeing the story. And honest, and really, the evidence is kind of in support of this. Against the Grain, a book by James C. Scott, came out a few years ago, talks about how before civilization, before the rise of the state, this is about 10,000, between 10 and 5,000 years ago, for about 100,000 years, humans are just around the earth. And what he calls it, James C. Scott, is basically a leisure society. Every, everything's pretty easy. You just go around, you light a fire. When you light a fire, animals are attracted to it. It's easy to kill. Uh, things are actually pretty sweet, you know? And really the population rate around the planet stays pretty similar for about 100,000 years. Right. We don't really get a, like an explosion of population until civilization starts. Right, which is like 10,000 BC or something People like that. People say 10,000, but it's really, if you're talking... There was like civilizations that would emerge and they basically would always fall because there's so many problems associated with early civilization. Hmm. Like when you bring all these different animals together, you know, it's, it, it's a breeding ground for disease. Uh, right. Which is interesting teams, looking at the, at the current moment and, and how like when, when you bring all of the entire earth together and have us, have us all interconnected through, you know, airplanes constantly and stuff like that. Any disease that gets around that's sufficiently bad, we, we get a we get a pandemic. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's, it's breeding ground. And when something takes off, it just wrecks it. You know, right? So there probably were tons of civilizations we don't even know about. You know, just because it's just a you're making everything concentrated and you're bringing in all these random factors right. together, and then it blows up. Yeah. But then a bit, really, it's about five thousand years ago that you get the first launch of successful civilization. Right. People say, you know, Ur and Uruk around Baghdad, cradle civilization. Um, so, and then it's at this time, and this is a big, people don't really understand state formation to this day. Scholars are talking about. It's very kind of ambiguous. Like, what is the state? Why do we have a state? They can say certain general features about it, but people don't really know. For Proudhon, Civilization is, is starts with religion. Right. Religion is there's something about religion. So his whole thing is religion and the state go together. He's trying to figure out what is it about religion that's made us have this social structure that we have. That's all top down, very authority at the top. What is it at the beginning, more or less? Proudhon, so Proudhon is saying in the beginning, his whole thing is about justice, right? Okay. And so in this time, early civilization, the type of justice that was 
was run was first run by religion you know religion was he called it authoritative justice religion tells you what to believe back in the day it tended to be an eye for an eye so they would say you know you Take this, you know, if you chop off my hand, I'm going to chop off your hand. Right, yeah, yeah. And that was predominant. I mean, around the globe, we see that over and over, like Code of Hammurabi, which was, I think, 3,000 something. It just kind of made sense, right? (laughs) And Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. No, you're right. Made sense. Of course it makes sense. And it's like, yeah, it's like retribution. Like you right. do There's this a perfect thing. reciprocality to, okay, this happened to you, so now it's going to happen Yeah, exactly. To me, right? <laughs> now we're even. Yeah. Okay, but then you start getting, I don't know if I should go into Proudhon or the modern literature on this, but what Proudhon said is, you know, he's coming out of this Christian background. He says the first revolution is Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus came along and basically rejected that whole eye for an eye mentality. And said, you know what? It's not about that. It's about justice is about forgiveness and love. And you know, justice is also it's something that's uh what's the term I'm looking for? It's it's done by the conscience, you know. Justice mm. is something, it's not some authority coming down and, and it's saying that happens like from the inside of you. Exactly. It's like mm. if I if me and you like have a falling out for some reason. Justice is me coming together with you. We come out, we it's, say it's for, what happened. Forgiveness, right? Which it's forgiveness, it, but forgiveness is it even the same thing as justice? Like it, that, that's interesting to say. Yeah, like that. That justice is forgiveness. For him, justice is the conscience. Conscience is, and right now he would say that everybody's conscience is terrible. I mean, or that's. Hmm. I'll discuss that more in a little bit, but. Now, today, well, I was going to backtrack. Today, the literature, Robert, I think his name's Robert, Robert Bella, sociologist. He has this big idea called the age of the axle age, which is like the age of prophets. So you see Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Buddha, um, Confucius, all between, I think it's like 700 BC to about like 680. You get all these prophets who come and they're they're saying this reinterpretation of justice, which is like it's not an eye for an eye. That's really what he's saying is is being rejected almost universally across the planet. Is this yeah, it's it is I'm trying to remember the term I use. Um yeah, you know what I'm saying. It's just yeah, well, I think no so. longer that. It's it's interesting to to like compare a little bit with the Christian theology because I mean obviously that that's a little bit closer to home for me and like sure. you know that there's there's scripture there's conversations about Jesus saying like you know I'm not actually here to to reject the law or to um to break it off but actually to fulfill it like to get to the bottom of it and actually take it to the next level like like Christ demands you know in order to keep the law it's not just don't don't kill your neighbor, but also don't even think about killing them. <laughs> right. Proudhon's view of Jesus is actually really interesting. I'm not an expert on it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really an expert on the Bible either. Um, but his his view is actually, I don't know, I've never heard it before. What he says is you know, maybe Jesus was like a divine figure, you know, from, he doesn't say if he is or he's not. But he also says that Jesus, everybody wanted Jesus to be the Messiah. They wanted a Messiah-like figure. And he calls, Proudhon calls Jesus the anti-Messiah. He's saying over over and over, I'm not the Messiah, okay? Like, he said, I think it's like, I am, but I am doesn't mean, like, literally what they think it means. But what he, Proudhon argues is they made a religion out of Jesus. Jesus never said to make religion out of me. Even though Jesus' teachings were correct, he never... He didn't say go start Christianity necessarily. Exactly. You yeah. know, that's like Peter and Paul, and that's humans taking this this word, turning it into something. Right. Okay. So that's his whole first revolution. His second revolution is the beginning of science, which All is right. we get the beginning of the printing press, and we also have you know they they challenge the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe. Um, if you know, today when we hear that, it just sounds ludicrous. Like, why would that be a big deal? If I say, yeah, the earth 
sun is actually the center of the the galaxy not the earth right. doesn't sound like that intense but back in the day it was huge i right. mean galileo was charged with heresy and like he, my understanding he had a conversation with the pope at the time and the pope was like well they were like friends with each other <laughs> just like you know this sucks but this is the situation like you can't say that you know that he's like well i have you know i have proof, mathematic <laughs> proof. yeah and so Sorry. really and because of that these kind of events what prudan is saying happened is the legitimacy of religion in terms of upholding justice is dismantled individuals in society now start spreading across society that it's now only the individual alone which can uphold justice that's what prudan argues is that mm. now it's only the conscience that can fulfill the role of justice so it's basically okay well that that's the second revolution now the third revolution is the last one she says it's the end of the aristocratic age the last one is putting our society, our social structure, in line with this idea of the individual is in charge of justice and the conscience. So what that means is, so the state, like I said before, is based, comes out of the beginning of civilization. It's this old institution that we've just carried along this entire time. He's saying that it runs on this old school idea of justice which is might makes right which is like you know whoever is the strongest is the one who decides who gets fucked up or whatever you know um so he's saying in order for there actually to be the fulfillment of basically jesus's prophecy uh is for people to understand that state is the monopoly of force in society, and that is completely against the, I'm forgetting the terminology, but the conscience being in charge of itself. Right now, it's force being in charge of everybody. You know, we like to think in a democracy that we're all free, you know, but we're not free. I mean, it's run by numbers, you know, it's run by what the majority says and what this group of people say, you know. At the end of the day, what they decide, this group, is told to everybody. You don't get to decide. The group so, gets to decide. Okay, so, so I think this kind of gets, at this point, we're, we're kind of sort of caught up, and we're, we're we're at the bottom of the problem, which is how do you get around, I think it around the problem of groups. Like, as soon as you want to interact with people, I, I remember recently reading a, a short essay by Orson Scott Card. Um, are you familiar with that guy? Mm -hmm. he's, he's wrote a really really good set of novels um uh, most popular of them was called ender's game but um he had a short essay just about stories and about writing and about myths and he he kind of proposed that you know our ability to get along is presupposes shared myths shared stories about and again what, what a story kind of contains is like not even necessarily an explicit but an implicit code of of ethics or of like goals of values right if, if we and, and so that, that kind of lines up i think with you said even prodon his understanding of of you know of yep. society it hinges on a <clears throat> on, on a, a mythical understanding of the universe or like a god or a religion right or it's like yeah that that's fundamentally even what i would associate religion with is sort of a, a story about reality about the universe right an absolute it's an absolute that the entire group agrees with you know in the beginning well, Go ahead. Oh, you said it. Okay. F finish your point, but I, I, I want to respond in a second. Okay. Um, well, I already, already okay. off trail. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, you said it's an absolute, but I, I think the key thing that's important about, you know, the transcendent nature of like a God figure is that it's something that's beyond your understanding. So even though like theoretically it's absolute, any conceptualization of it is not absolute, right? It's so a transcendent very, idea. This is a very important part as well. So um, Proudhon is known for saying God's evil. Right. That's another. <laughs> so, you know, at face value, he sounds like, whoa, this guy is you know, off his rocker. He's like, you know, bizarre. Really, he, and he's also known for property is theft and I'm an anarchist and community is death. He's saying all these statements, but none of it, he's actually meaning it literally. 
Right. All of it are aphorisms. He's just kind of trolling know, with, with some, some, he's kind some of memes the to get some troll. attention. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it, it kind of backfired on him because now he's been <laughs> totally forgotten in history. I mean, right. he's only just now reemerging. But he says God's evil. What is he? What does he yeah. mean by that? I mean, that's a great way to start a conversation if you want to get people to <laughs> get upset God's at you evil. and ask you some questions, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, his so what, whole what does thing, he mean by that? Okay. So his whole thing is. You know, in the beginning, everybody, religion is everything in, in civilization. And within, they're worshiping God or God's, uh, if we're not saying what they're really worshiping, they just don't know it, is a shared idea of justice. Mm -hmm. He's saying justice is inside of religion. Right. So what he's saying, what he means by God's evil is that, okay, if we look at the Old Testament, God's kind of like an asshole. I mean, he's like real, like authoritarian. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, you can do this or I'm going to like destroy you. Okay. Like there's no if and if. Then what Prudon's saying is that like New Testament, thing, he kind of changes. There's something, something seems to be a little bit softer or a little right. bit nicer. So Prudon is, is trying to understand, well, what is it? What's going on there? So what Prudon realizes this goes back to his conversations with Marx, is, well, society, what's, he tries to understand, what's society? Society, the only thing I can say about society is that it's moving. Everything inside of it is moving. Right. Nothing not moving. He says, instead of, I think, therefore I am, that famous statement, he says it should be, I move, therefore I become. Movement is, is everything. Right. Okay? So he's saying, even when society tries to think about the absolute, which is, you know, everything, it's really only talking about its movement. It can't get outside of its movement. It's encapsulated by movement. Right. So when it's trying to think of, oh, this is what God is, it doesn't come close to even understanding what the absolute is. So when, when humans are, are saying, like in the Old Testament, they're struggling with this idea of what's God, really only describing themselves you know they're really only describing their society two three thousand years ago in ancient jerusalem or wherever their view of god was judge the right. uh, king you know and over time jesus came and other people came and we see that this translation this understanding of god is moving over time and it's changing right now prudon says it's moved so far where we're at now that we can't pretend that we know what God wants anymore. We can't pretend that we, oh, this is what God wants me to do. He wants me to not take the vaccine or whatever. You know, like, no, you don't know shit about God, okay? The only thing that God can do, really, for to say that we know God's will or whatever, it's just fucking things up. I mean, it has no place anymore in our secular society or whatever. He's not saying that God doesn't exist. That's kind of where his genius is at. <laughs> He's saying that now, today, God is evil, at least in the sense of like the Old Testament God of being this like, you're not, you're going to talk, be good to your neighbor, okay? And, right. or else, you know, you're going to go to hell. Yeah. I, I think even I would, I would agree with that <laughs> to some extent in that every, every conception of a just ideal is always going to be comparatively evil to a, potentially future more mature conceptualization of the you know maximum ideal mm -hmm. right so i mean like yeah. again i i look at the old testament and i see wow this is incredible that we were even able to begin to understand this conception of god like begin to understand a better i mean obviously an eye for an eye is way better than i'll kill you if you take out my eye that's that's a that's right. a ethical revolution that just happened there and that's in, like sure. I mean, that's insane that they, they, they figured that out like that that works way better and and mm -hmm. suddenly there's this the reciprocality and there, there's a there's a social contract that people to unify people in, in a way that doesn't just kill the group right the right. So society be begins to stand for a little while and obviously there's still right. some serious problems there and and it's like I, I i view again i view this story of of, of the tradition of, of christianity or but of religion in general as, as sort of a gradual discovery of god not a um Sure. You know, a forgetting so, or of or of so what Proudhon is arguing is that in the beginning justice was contained in the shell of God. Like when they think of justice, they're really thinking of God. Now today he's saying this justice needs to come out of the shell. 
That is the only absolute he's saying that, that can exist in a secular society. There needs to be kind of like what you were saying, some kind of shared ideal. There has to be something. He's saying this is the only possible one is justice. He, that's why he calls himself an anti-theist hmm. is because he's saying religion. So could, you, could you remind me, remind me again? What, what's his, is he have like a, a pretty technical definition of what justice is? It's like, okay. it has to do with like individual um, conscience redemption, like feeling redeemed yes. or feeling justified. The ultimate definition he uses is justice is the recognition of human dignity. So hmm. Interesting. If you're familiar with Kant, Kant is, you know, he's trying to come up with, I always forget the stupid term, the categorical imperative. Okay. He's trying to figure out what is the duty that all humans need to uphold. Okay. Don basically comes along and says, what we need to uphold is respect for other humans. That's it. I mean, that if all humans can, can uphold that one thing, which... He's saying that that's the only absolute needed in society. So it, it, he's he's taking he's taking almost like I said, it's like an inversion of Christianity in a very bizarre way. This is why I like Proudhon, because these are ideas that I haven't heard before yeah. a few years ago. You know. Well, I mean, it's interesting again looking at the the way that Christ talked about ethics and about law. Was that okay? You can sum up again. He didn't. The narrative is a little bit different. It's not a, a superseding and a throwing out of the old, but actually like a, a deeper advancement on kind of the evolution of the, of the, of ethics and of truth and of understanding of God. And, and so Christ says, "I'm not throwing out the old law, but here actually this is going to sum up the old law in a more specific way that actually is going to be more applicable and even easier to remember because it's just two commandments rather than ten or I forget how many how many laws there are in it." Levitical laws and stuff like that, but you know the the two commandments that Jesus gives are love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Which I mean, it sounds like it kind of lines up pretty closely with that prudent or or, or with with sure. Did you say with with, so with Kant's uh, understanding, which was you said it was just to respect others, right? Right. To respect the almost the um, what did you say? There's a an idea dignity. Of, well, yeah, there's dignity, or or you could even say like there's like a, a sort of a divine value. I mean, that that's sort of modern humanism is just like that. There's something distinctly valuable about humanity for some reason, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, what I was gonna say is, um, you're talking about how Jesus pulled from tradition, but was also like forward thinking. You know, he wasn't just caught in the past. He was also saying like, this is what needs to be done. You know. That's what Proudhon says. That's why he's the ultimate revolutionary, is because he understands you have to pull from tradition. You can't just reject tradition altogether. Mm. You, know, you have to continue. There has to be a continuation, but there also has to be a path forward. You know. So he's saying what he's trying to do is show that look, we can take all of these traditions with us. Okay, but it just has to be changed. Right. You know, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, right now I'm thinking a little bit about. You know, this is we're pretty close to Easter, and thinking about the you know, that's that's a holiday sur surrounding like the the death and resurrection of of Christ, right? Which sure. I, I like to read and think about that story from the perspective of the disciples, which is that you know their conception of God was that you know I, again it was it was kind of that Old Testament God where it's like this judge that 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 does does the sort of eye for an eye thing, and and there's you know they had this like we've been oppressed by Rome, and. Uh, let's go fuck these guys up you know <laughs> and so that they they thought you know god's gonna come down and he's gonna he's just gonna slay all their enemies and then christ is gonna rule and reign and he's gonna reestablish israel as as this right as this powerful kingdom and that that doesn't happen what right? happened? they they watch right. the person that they've you know got to know and become friends with and have become convinced is a a human a human manifestation, human incarnation of God, they watch him die, and along with him dying, they see their, I mean, dying is not something they expected God would do, so their entire conception of God is dying along with their friend, right? Sure. And, and so, to me, the importance of, of this, of that story as a Christian is thinking about, yeah, my my understanding of God, I need to take time every year to let that die. That's and I, very why, and 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 let it again. And I mean, three days later, which 
mythologically speaking, is the amount of time it takes to get to the underworld and back. Originally, I think that one of the first um, is this really old Mesopotamian myth about um, Inanna, and it's called Inanna's descent, and she's the, she's this goddess goddess that goes down to the bottom of the underworld, surrenders. You know, every she has to go through the seven gates of hell, and every gate she has to take off a piece of of um, something that identifies her as royal, so like jewelry or clothing and things like this. She gets to the bottom, and then she she comes up out of the underworld, and and the the moral of the story is kind of again really abstract, and I think that's the important part of like ancient mythology is, is that it's it's getting at ideals in a very abstract way, and that's why it ends up continuing to be meaningful because it isn't so like you were talking about before. It, it's not so. Um, solid so um it, it it leaves some space to, to develop and to and to grow into and, and to become more mature and understanding of it as you interpret it right and yeah. so i mean that story is associated with you know it takes three days to get to the underworld and and then inan is the first god to come back from that underworld story but christ does the same thing he dies and he spends he, he goes he, he, within the christian story is that he he goes down to the bottom of hell and he sets free the saints that are imprisoned there, which is not a concept <laughs> I totally understand even, but right. It's like Christ goes to, to the bottom of the, of, of the underworld and, and somehow redeems the whole thing. And he, you know, he comes back up and it's, so it's not a, uh, a discarding of, of the old God. It's like a, a renewal of God. And, and it, mm -hmm. you know, he, he resurrects yeah. the next day and or three days later after he's done this process. And suddenly it's like, wait, so we, so, so we can still have a conception of God even though almost everything we thought about God, or at least the things we thought were important about God, were wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put it. And it reminds me a lot of what Proudhon is saying about the end of times, you know, revelations, the whatever, I, I forget the terms, you know. But what he's saying there is when justice comes to reign on earth, the way he conceives of it, which is the individual conscience, it's the reign of kingdom of God, basically. It is the fulfillment of the book of Revelations, he's saying. Once we realize that Holy Spirit is really the conscience, really, and that by allowing us to exercise it, it becomes stronger within us, he's saying that by that taking over, that really is what the book of Revelations is talking about. Or mm -hmm. I am not even sure if the book of Revelations is the, is the best book talking about the end of times well it's it, the the end of like is you, when you think about revelation you usually think about the crazy judgment and the plagues and the blood and the locusts and all this stuff right but like the, there's the ending that's really really one of the most moving parts of of reading any section of the bible is this descent of like a new city and like suddenly god and men and are, are dwelling together and everything is like I, I think i've only sat down and read that section of the bible like two or three times and it, I, I don't even Daniel, want. Though? I guess yeah. The, the book of what that does talk about the end of times or whatever. Yeah, that, that uh, talks about the end of time too. Yeah. But like you see, <clears throat> in America, we have all these Trump people, and they they say right now is the end of times. You know, right. and it reminds me of what you're talking yeah. about, like how the people they're basing it on this old idea of this is what's going to happen. Okay, I know, you know, this is you know God's going to come down and. You're going to go to hell and, and it's it's really like there's no way that's going to happen okay and if it were to occur that what Pugan is saying is right it would kind of be almost exactly like what you're saying about the total trans it's a total inversion of what the people who thought call themselves believers what actually is going to occur is that they're so wrong i mean they think that they know the truth and stuff like that at least here in north carolina they're just become a hate mongering group right. i mean yeah. i don't know if you saw that the the, uh, the trump meeting uh, where there was like a golden statue of trump i mean it's just yeah. like what are y'all doing i mean y'all have lost your mind i mean i don't know it's just like they yeah. have raised him to the level of prophecy like a prophet and so it's just what it, it sounds like fundamentally the Prudonian, I don't know if I could say that Prudonian perspective That's the term. Yeah. Uh, would would be almost a, a reaction to you know a conception of justice that's that's uh, isolated from the individual conscience and is exclusively negotiated by society and it's like okay obviously that's a problem your your individual moral compass ought to play into the picture 
so especially when it, it, you know you see all these stories of like even, even very modern stories of just like i mean I'm thinking of like so many like Disney movies, but just like common stories that we all seem to believe in is just, yeah, the, the, the primacy of the individual where it's like society says one thing, but you know in your heart you're supposed to do that. That's like almost the central message of all that I grew up learning from Disney was, you know, follow your heart, right? Which yeah. that that's that's really important. And I think, again, that's probably, probably was responsive to another uh, moment in society where, where we had focused kind of too much on a on a pre-established metric for for what is right and what is wrong and that there needs to be uh, within the christ the christ story is, is that there's yeah the, the holy spirit comes after christ and, and the holy spirit becomes one of the main ways in which we are led throughout the world right the, the, the holy spirit is supposed to be somebody who comes beside the christian and and leads them towards morality and wisdom and stuff like that i i think the the fundamental difference that um, you and I might have, though, is that I, I think that that's important. Maybe we don't differ on this, but I want to see kind of what you say about this, is that I, I think that that moral compass and that individual understanding of right and wrong is is so important. It's just that it needs to be... Um, I don't think it needs to supersede the, the, the social negotiation of morality, but it needs to be plugged into it. And it... Sure. So it's like, you know... It, I always like to think about things on the scale of a family because it's one of the easiest things to, to conceptualize because we all have a family and it's it's not so abstract. Like there, there's still an abstract entity of the family, but there's obviously individuals within the family. Mm -hmm. And a family, when one person and their conception of what ought to be has taken over is a pretty ugly thing. But a family that has no cohesion between, you know, everybody's, each individual's moral compass and understanding of I mean, it, a family that has no shared myth, right? No shared understanding of where we ought to be going in life. It's not that's not even really a family, right? What makes it a family is is somewhat the cohesion of narratives and also the individuality of the narratives. Okay. Yeah, I what Pragan would say, and I kind of agree with, is that the only shared idea that we well, a family can have all kinds of shared ideals like you're saying. But in terms of the family that has no shared ideals, there has to be something like you're saying. He's saying, again, it has to be recognition of human dignity has to be there. So like my aunt is a hardcore Trumper. She's also a hardcore racist. I mean, he says right. the N word all the time. And, you know, I mean, that's she doesn't respect human di dignity. Right. That's like that's missing. You know, she calls herself Christian. You know, she's not. I mean, she, she's Christian in some sense. I guess, but it's like she's not a good person. Okay, I can say that. It's like there has to be some shared ideal. And that's where I, I agree with you. But it's like, what is the shared ideal? Well, at minimum, it has to be that we respect other people. Right. You know. Yeah, I, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think I even see it kind of as so as you get more and more distant from the individual, you, your your shared narrative become needs to become broader and broader. So sure. I think like the, the narrative you can have with your family can be fairly specific. And like you were saying, you, you can have more shared ideals with your family, but then with Definitely. your community, you don't want to, each family doesn't, you shouldn't have any particular family taking over entirely with their set of ideals and subjecting the whole community to that. You, there's still a sort of is a hierarchy that ends up being arranged of, you know, seemingly obviously better ideas and, and the community latches onto them. So there's some negotiation happening there, but there's you still again you want to have some still some individuality of the families within that community and so there's there's a cohesion and there's an individuality there too and as if you want to continue to have that play that game on every level once you get to the point of relating to all humans the only story that you can that you can conceivably still relate on has to be one as broad and as general as something like the exactly yeah something very broad and for a family it could be whatever um oh yeah i was going to say the other, in his first work, Rudan, it's all about the Bible. Just nobody reads it anymore. The Celebration of Sunday. Uh, hmm. He writes that the community is death. Okay, and so, well, one, it, this is connected with property. He says the state and the property are inherently connected, right? So the state needs to be reconstituted through a social contract. Instead of being imposed on everybody, we need to sign a contract. With property, he's saying that without property community basically runs over the individual like on a commune 
individual is like he's kind of the community becomes kind of like has all the power you know the right. individual has almost no power what the individual needs is property he's saying it once the individual has property which is a certain level of dignity and respect then the community becomes something beautiful you know but when the community is everything when there's no right. weight counterweight of the community it can become tyrannical that yeah. makes sense and, and yeah. that's that's kind of fundamentally how i look at at the problem of tyranny is just when you get well maybe that's not quite where we've gone but i mean the way i think about it is is just too radical of a disconnect between levels of interrelation between those that kind of stacking relationship so like yeah if if a family be, has, has all of the power and the individual has no power or, or, or of decision but it's like you want to continue to to stack those things appropriately so like looking balance. at yeah what well, it's it sort of balance it, it might be like fractals might be a better way even of thinking about it okay yeah or um yeah i mean so, i mean looking at looking at the west right now it's like i, I can see why movements focused on the individual are becoming so prominent and, and are getting so much traction because I feel like we you know again we've, we've kind of we tend to just choose an either or rather than an incorporative uh, stance whenever it comes to philosophical exactly. evolution or political evolution is and so I we've kind of it. made it you know it's the United States which even within that idea, again, I'm, I'm not part of the United States, but I'm kind of looking at it from the outside mm -hmm. in, and, and obviously a lot of my friends are, are American. Uh, there's the United States, but I think they're kind of too united, you know? <laughs> and and yeah. there's so such high populations that it, to me it almost seems like it would make sense to even have another intermediary level between the states. I don't know if this would actually work because there's <laughs> multiple levels to the problem because now we also have the internet, so everybody's relating to each other via that too. So that's kind of interesting. But like... There's so much uh, disconnect between the level of influence you have on the world around you as an individual and that governing structure at the top. And there's there's not a lot of weight on those intermediary structures. There's not like... And right. I, I think even part of that might even have to do with the way that we follow stories about ourselves in the country and the world around us because we don't tend to, at least speaking personally here, I. I don't tend to pay as much attention to the stories about my local government as I do about America and Trump because these are like exciting stories to go and be a part of. It's like it's popular yeah. to talk about them and it's not it's not as you don't get as much clout for um <laughs> for sure. you know having a thoughtful conversation about your local government or or even you know what's something happening in your very very local community. Yeah. There's a psychoanalyst from 20th century Eric Fromm I like him a lot. He argues that people in today's world, individuals, they feel powerless. And I agree. I mean, I think you look around people, they feel powerless. Mm -hmm. So what do they look for? They look for someone who's looking like they're very powerful and they're in charge. And so people are like, that's my guy. You know, that's, they cling to it, you know? And really instead of religion, it's like Christianity, it's become kind of like a cult of the individual. You know, we, we go to this individual, we basically worship them and we give them all of this, our energy. And we're just, you know, that's what it's become. And we have these little idols, these little, these individuals right. who have little cults around them. Yeah. And, and it's because people feel afraid for the future and they feel powerless. They don't yeah. feel like they can do anything, which is just basically because our system feels like we can't control it. I was watching the the Incredibles two the other night with my wife, and there's this awesome monologue in the middle of it by the by the, by one of the villains, and he talks about how superheroes are sort of just an excuse to 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 get rid of any responsibility for dealing with your problems of life, because if you can kind of identify with some grand person in charge and make kind of let let them fight all your battles for you, then then you don't have any battles to fight, right? Which right. is that's the same problem is that we've, we've kind of rat, we retreated from the realm of, of familial and communal and, and local politics and, and, and things like that, or, or even church communities, spiritual communities, that sort of thing. We've retreated from that to a much more comfortable couch where we can sit and watch our, we can kind of watch the gods fight. We can watch Trump and right. Hillary and, Ob and Obama and Biden and, and, 
all these different people battle it out and and we we don't we don't really risk anything because we have a whole community that we get to cheer along with Brom talks about he he connects it to protestantism i don't know how much you agree with that he says protestantism becomes all about the individual their salvation and becomes whereas catholicism is much more about community and like totally i 100 percent agree with that what'd you say you agree oh yeah yeah and so Protestantism becomes kind of like, it's all in God's hands. Like, I can't do anything, okay? I'm powerless. Like, I don't do, the only thing is just to pray hard enough to get into heaven, okay? Yeah. And if I get into heaven, that, that becomes the whole goal of Protestantism. It's not the whole goal. But if you compare an average believer, this is the guy, Jean-Marie Gaillet, French guy. He says that the average Christian, they don't care about God. The only thing they care about is eternal life. So if you were to tell them, if you were to tell Man. someone, okay, well, I hate to tell you, Christian, but there's no God, they're actually still heaven. <laughs> he, he he thinks that most people won't be bummed out. They'll be like, oh, hell yeah, that's awesome. That's a that rough really, criticism. And that really is what a lot of people, how they view it, is yeah. I want to get into heaven. All I need to do is believe the right thing and just, Sit back, sit on the couch, watch TV, and that's all that's required of me. Right. You know, and it's like, no, that's terrible. Okay. Right. That's not what being a person. Christianity used to be about how to live life, you know, how to, what you should do to your neighbor, what you should, you know, love life. And then it became this kind of death cult about like how to get into, how get, to get into heaven life. and not get into hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it's right. become. And yeah. it's like, that's terrible. Okay. That's yeah. not what it's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. And it's, Again, so I mean, being part of the the Protestant tradition, I I totally see that see that line in in the in the history of of my tradition, and it's it's really saddening for me to look at. But it's like I I I also see sort of the necessity of of that Protestant conversation and that voice happening in that moment because I think it might even be similar to conversations about libertarianism, where it's like you know the the institution becomes so overpowering and, and you be it's so looming and, and so impossible to feel like you i mean again when it comes to morality and conscience it's like when you don't feel like you're free to live what you really deeply feel that god is telling you or even telling you and your local community and you can't live out what that understanding that conception of what god wants you to do because the pope said no this is what we're all going to do right you've totally right chopped out all of the intermediary structures between the Pope and the individual. And you've just said, okay, I'm in charge and everybody's going to do exactly what I say. Right. You, right. you, you lose that, you know, that, that fractal individuality that I feel like is so important for a stable and an active effective structure. Um, and so I, it's like, I, I see in that moment in, in the, in the church history, it's like, Oh, obviously we need to go in and, break off from the community so that way we can begin to focus on our individual understanding of justice. But then you get this, it, it breeds this really sad form of, of Christianity, which is exactly what we were talking right. about it. Like so focused on afterlife and individual salvation that there's no longer any, any community. Right. Right. Uh, Proudhon, he, he talks about Protestantism and he says that, yeah, you know, Luther was right in breaking away from the church. Like you're saying, like, he was really representing what the, the conscience was all about in that time. But then he went and created another religion. It's like you're <laughs> saying this religion was even more oppressive than Catholicism. And so he just basically exchanged religions, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and this religion had whole different values than the one before. There's a lot of similarities still. Protestantism is not all bad, you know? I don't want to... Well, it's like, like the trajectory of my, my personal... Uh, journey with with the christian faith right now is like uh a deep desire to try to reconnect with that that kind of communal tradition of orthodoxy and catholicism not at the expense of like i i, I don't want to not be protestant anymore i want protestantism to figure out how to find its way to, to plugging into that structure and so it can become this richer version of itself right the fact that you're choosing a religion you know what to believe is a protestant value by itself yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever you mean, before, it's always just what you're raised in, you know? Right. And now, that, that is the value of Protestantism. It's, yeah. It's for you to decide, you know? You're well, in the Bible alone. It's supposed to be. 
and like I, I feel like that's both Protestant and not Protestant because like the reason I don't want to be something else. I, the reason I don't, I don't want to go and be Orthodox or Catholic is because I was born and raised Protestant, and so I want to be. <laughs> yeah, weird paradox going on. Yeah. <laughs> but so when it comes to, I mean, what you've said so far hasn't struck me at any particular point as like super radical, um, no, anarchistic or anything like that. It's, yeah, it's, it's is it is it just a meme to you? more so as far as like associating with. Like, can, can you explain or make the case for like what, what does like the word anarchism have to offer that we need to learn right now in the world? Sure. Well, one, Proudhon never used the term anarchism. If you want okay. to get technical, he only used the term anarchy and anarchist. Okay. But, so what he was saying is, state government is based on force, monopoly of force, and it ho- holds property, property based on authorization. What needs to happen is it needs to be inverted, which is instead of based on force, state needs to be based on a contract. So this is basically the idea of a social contract from so, so and how. Can I stop you right there? Because I, I want to make sure I'm, I, I see the difference because sure. wh- how, how is a contract not He's saying a, a literal contract. Yeah. How is a so literal contract and, not, not yet, not associated with force? Okay, so with Bruce, okay, that's a good question. So with, with, we often assume that terms of a contract are solely backed by force. That is true in our current society, but really a contract is backed by society itself. The society sets the terms of a contract. If, if someone signs a contract and it's exploitative according to society, the contract's null and void, you know? So. Let me backtrack about the use of force. So right now, force is kind of so many different ways to approach this. I'm kind of struggling with which way to approach it. Force right now is is above society. It's kind of government is above society. It controls society. Right. And that kind of goes back to the Habib the Hobbes way of looking at the world, which is, you know, man in the state of nature is terrible and they hate each other. And the only way they can make a contract, put this government on top of them to control them. Because we need that. We need right. uh, a paternalistic organization, what Hobbes would say. Okay, well, Proudhon is saying that was the case. Things have changed, okay? Today, we no longer need this thing over society. In fact, what needs to be done is it needs to be inverted. So instead of it being imposed on top of us, the individual really needs to be able to sign a contract with another person and say, okay, you know, this is the terms that I'm willing to agree with. He's saying that... So we just just sort of voluntarily choose to submit ourselves to contracts? It would no longer, according to Proudhon, be a... So he's against the idea of government. Government is a paternalistic, top-down, force-driven state for Proudhon is administrative, which is, you know, uh, our roads and our electricity and things mm-hmm. like that. They're administratively run through monopolies. Proudhon is saying, you know, we need monopolization to some degree. And these are typically administrative things. Do we need governance anymore or can we self-govern? Proudhon is saying we can self-govern. The only way that that can happen is if property is changed because property right now is causing havoc. Property is based on the states right now and they have authorized the entire planet. So there are people, there are people who have property, people who don't have property. It's just it's a binary in society. Right. People who don't have property are basically screwed. I mean, it's yeah. very difficult to get by in this world. If you don't have property. Yeah. But it's, it's crazy. The, the amount of, uh, the, the the value of property continues to climb it seemingly no matter what like uh, every every older person in my life is like oh you just got to invest in property and it's like well, why do you have why is property so important it's just like it's it's yeah see we've, we've taken over the entire planet with property like the, the whole planet is claimed right you know and it doesn't adjust itself for differences in population it stays basically the same right. you claim properties Based on the government, it can't change. 
goes on saying property needs to be based on occupation and use. So in like a in a company, that would be like a cooperative or like member owned, which is you know, instead of top down where it's run by stockholders and they have Proudhon saying everything Proudhon is a big inversion basically across mm -hmm. society. He's saying everything needs to be inverted. And so property would be inverted here, the state would be inverted here. And by doing so, he's saying that that brings out the conscience. And so could that's you Proudhon's anarchy? Could you um apply that philosophy to just again so i can conceptualize it easily could you apply that to a family how do you invent the, the political structure of a family yeah so okay so prudon i keep saying that word but prudon argues that the idea of government kind of comes from the idea of the family with the family he's trying to figure out what is it what is this thing that is giving us this what he says is this just this idea of paternalism within all of us across Pater society. Paternalism? Yeah, paternalism, which is okay. just, you know, like the father like figure, which is the father knows best, you know. Hmm. For Perdon, he actually, this is why he's kind of misogynistic, is he thinks that that's the right way is that the woman stays in the home, the man is in charge of the family, the man is the one who, he's saying it shouldn't go beyond the family. Really what an anarchist way of looking at a family would be, you know, to bring out the conscience within the, within the child, you know, like I have a child, he's three months now. And so in the beginning, yeah, I'm going to be, there is a little bit of paternalism that has to be there in the beginning. He didn't know anything, you know, I have to pick him up, change his diaper and shit like that. But over time that has to lessen. And they can't be there. I shouldn't be 30 years old, 30, what am I, 33, and have a paternalistic relationship with my father. You know, that's not how it should be at this point in time. Right. Same thing with my son. It's like as he gets older, we need to eventually become on the same level. There's got to be a handoff, know? yeah. Yeah, we need to become brothers in Christ, you know. With that. Sure. But so that's. Is that an inversion? Because that, that, it, it seems like a, a continuation of the same pattern. Or are you family saying you don't, structure? Yeah, with the family structure, it, it hasn't inverted. So the it's family just, structure, no, you're right. I mean, there's not really an inversion there. I shouldn't call it an inversion. The Perdon was the family, keep it the same, basically. Mm -hmm. That's what he, he basically argued. Okay. Well, I mean, I remember okay. talking t to another friend I'll about... Drink. Oh, go ahead. Go for it, dude. What were you saying? Well, so the, yeah, I was talking to another friend about that. He was really, um, really won over by, uh, by, by Marx's ideas, um, specifically. And I, I've only, I tried to read, I think I tried to read the communist manifesto, which is, is, it, is that by Marx or is it just by the movement surrounding Marx? Manifesto is written by Marx and Engels. Actually, okay. It is written by, oh yeah, and Engels. Okay. So, I mean, I started trying to read that. I didn't, didn't get all the way through it. Um, but. I Not think. <laughs> well, I don't think so personally. Fr from what I I understood is that that like the um, what Marx had had a oftentimes a very profound critique of of you know government and of capitalism and the way things were, but it's just that his alternative wasn't wasn't great. It was it didn't tend to work out, but it, like at least his critique was good or was was, it was meaningful. Anyways, there was some good stuff there. So I, again, I I haven't got too deep into it myself, but I mean the idea of a flipping of a structure so even of a, of a business this is something i was talking about with my other friend who was kind of into communism um the idea of just like even just talking about unions and talking about renegotiating the way that you know a boss and an employees have their dynamic I, I could never totally wrap my head around that idea of it actually being in an an, an an inversion at least of, of like i mean you think about like a pyramid inversion it's like okay there's a singular point and there's a multiplicity and you want to flip it up flip. Mm -hmm. my friend. You want to flip that up upside down so there's like all these people ruling what, you know, one in particular person or something like that. I, well, a bunch of people usually. What Proudhon is saying, the inversion takes place at the level of property. So right now, because of property, when we go to a company typically, there is typically a hierarchy which we rent ourselves to. You know, mm -hmm. we say, okay, you know, 
you go in the labor market and you find someone who's willing to pay you for your work. They tell you what to do. They tell you, do this, do that. There's no real autonomy in it. He's saying like, you know, basically a cog in a machine. You're almost like a new kind of slavery. I mean, it's wage slavery. In the 1800s, that was a very common term, wage slavery. We See, don't use that anymore. But like uh, my understanding of slavery is that it's not different from employment or even from participation in a family in kind, only in degree of separation of, of power, I would say. So I, I don't think that they're actually fundamentally different. I don't think participating family. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think participation, even participation in a, in a long term relationship. I mean, that's a, that's a very very small and very easy to conceptualize form of a family, right? You're still both submitting yourselves to a hierarchy of a, a contract of, of a commitment, and that thing stands above both of you. And the, right. the ideals that you both agree on, you know, it's not that both of you actually get to be in charge. It's that the 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 mutual agreements you've come to are in charge of both of you, right? Your marriage sure. is in charge of you. Well, that would be the case if it wasn't so, if I wasn't forced, if I wasn't going to starve without selling my labor. You know, right? the, the contract, it's not fair, you know, because yeah. one party is okay. sitting back relaxing, the other party is desperate. I mean, the other party is saying, like, I have to have a job. I have to find someone to hire me or else I won't be able to feed my family. So it's mm -hmm. not a fair agreement, right. like Proudhon is saying. Proudhon is saying if people do have property, that goes away, you know, because then I can self-sustain and there's no force in the economy to force me to sell my labor to someone. So for him, it is an inversion in the workforce. And for him, that's the whole revolution for Proudhon, is the individual to be in control of their work is really what it is, is instead of once you are in control of your work and it's something you enjoy doing, conscience really is the driver, he's saying. The conscience is what is going to drive the individual worker. And he's saying that slowly happening across the economy is the revolution, an alternative economy. The thing is, a conscience isn't in my understanding, I, I don't think a conscience is something that like sort of eternally exists in an individual sort of mysteriously uh, and is unaffected by anything in their surrounding. I, I think even the the understanding, the the law that you have written on your heart, to, to use Christian terminology, I don't think that that's something that you just kind of figure out when you're, or you're just born with and suddenly it's just, it's totally static throughout your life. I, I think part of of uh the entity that is your conscience is is shaped by social relationships so it's with your society with with your immediate Definitely. peers with your family right and so again you're you're still sort of submitted to all of those people and all the all, all those that, that you're in a relationship with and it's i see what you're saying you're saying okay well what's the difference between that and that yeah Right. Well, the difference is right now, I don't have any say in. I'd say I don't have any say in like the government right now. Because right now, everything's just imposed on me. I don't have a say in anything. I'm born into this world. I can't, can't do. Sh the only thing I can do is find someone who's willing to hire me right. and go work for them. It's not really much of a life. What he's saying is I should be able to negotiate my life. I should be able to say I don't want you. just because I'm born here doesn't mean I have to submit to your government. Okay, I don't want to submit to your government. Just because I'm born here doesn't mean I have to abide by the lines that you draw on the ground. You know, I can decide my own the way I am looking at things. all this way of how everything's organized is imposed on all of us. Right. And there's really nobody at the top. It's really all of us who are upholding this structure that's just ruining all of us. Yeah. Don's argument at the end of the day is just we live in a totally immoral society. I mean, we, and because society is arranged the way it is, we wind up doing all kind of terrible things to each other. And, we, and so we just justify it regularly, you know? And since, mm. I, I think you brought this up earlier, it really, the blame lays nowhere. You know, terrible things happen. We, just, we get to point to our superheroes or our gods exactly. or our, or our politicians. You point at a company. 
You know, you point at a company and you go to the company and you're suing the company. Well, you know, it's none of us, none of us individuals. It's just this abstract entity, you know. And so blame is just passed around. Yeah. Nothing ever gets done. So like the Iraq war, there's never been anything. I mean, there's never been anybody to come and say, oh, I fucked up. Okay, like, that's my bad. No, there's nobody to point the finger at. You can point it at the collective United States. United people in the United States. The, the thing for it. is that yeah, we've all we've kind of even lost. Like I don't feel that much, you know, sort of national pride, and the, and the national pride even like is kind of associated with nationalism and like racism or or xenophobia and stuff like that. It, 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 when when people are kind of pointing a finger at people who have some sense of national pride. Because there's there's basically like no ed identification with the country other than I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to play two games at once. We're trying to have a country that we can blame everything on whenever we're not whenever things go wrong, and that you know whenever things go right, we can say yeah, that's my team. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> we want to have our cake and eat it too. Exactly. It's a group narcissism. You know, when things are going bad, oh, it's not us. Things are going good. Look at me, everyone. You know, I'm the best. Yeah. It's just, I agree with Purana. It's a totally immoral society. And it's because the individual is powerless, feels powerless, doesn't have any hope for the future. They don't see any kind of way out. You know, there so, really doesn't appear to be any way out. So his uh, solution is just every individual should have property and we start there. It is that, but it, it goes further than that. Okay. Like I was saying before, it goes back, it's all connected. But he's saying it's really religion is the root of it all. You know, religion as a social, as a way of thinking is very dogmatic. It's very, this is the truth. You believe it. Okay. Believe what this guy in the church tells you to believe. Mm -hmm. you should, you know, pay your tithes and then shut up okay i mean that's really he's saying that this like i said it's not jesus or, or christian thought that he's against he's against the idea that the, the, the way of thinking that is religion which is someone else knows what's best and i'll just follow okay you tell me what to do oh, okay i believe that jesus died for my sins okay i did that you know that's but all so i need to going do. back to the personal conscious conscience thing that still assumes other people have an idea of what we might you know what might be best it's just that we bring it into ourselves and we kind of abstract a little bit of a code based on our interactions with other people and their understanding and the stories they tell about reality right like even because our personal consciences get polluted by the world around us we can't get around social socially negotiated conceptions of an ideal like as soon as you're talking to somebody else and you want to be in a relationship with them you build a little country there between the two of you and now there's a little government that's governing you because you've you've come to some agreements about things and now those agreements govern you and <laughs> sure yeah reality is socially constructed we do that all the time groups are real people act act like it's only individuals no i mean groups are real and they're they have real effects on the world you know yeah People, don't get me started. I don't know if I sociology has really opened my eyes. The fact that most people don't understand at all what is going on. You know, they really, they just think there's a bunch of individual decisions. You know, I'm not connected to it. You know, I'm just born here. I have nothing to do with it. And it's like no, we're all connected to this thing. You know, we're mm -hmm. all in it. Like, and yeah, there's like. I think you brought it up earlier about family being its own kind of thing. You know, it is, it, it's real. Same thing as society. Like, we think society is just an abstraction. Well, it's real in its consequences. You know, like mm -hmm. it actually has real consequences on the earth. Groups do, you know, like religion does. That makes sense. Yeah. But I, the, the critique of is it a critique of religion as a it, it seems like what as far as everything you've explained about that critique of religion is just that it was a critique of that version of religion or of that that you know that incarnation of 
He's saying religion and the state go together, which is yeah. paternalistic belief. Mm -hmm. Deep down, there is this paternalism, which is this guy above me knows better. Right. And this guy above him knows better. And he's saying this bullshit. Okay. This way of thinking is wrong. The only person that knows what's best for you is in is this, you know, inside of you. And but this, that person it, is influenced by all those people. Sure. The meaning is negotiated. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. You're saying, oh, isn't just society taking over of the individual? Well, I, I guess I'm saying that there's, I, I see the critique and I think it's meaningful, but I, I think that the the point ought to be let's not to, to totally get rid of governments and get rid of religions and get rid of shared cohesive narratives. It's just to let them die every once in a while and renegotiate, right? It, it's that that passion narrative of, okay, your understanding of God has to die every year. Your understanding of, of the way government ought to run. I mean... I like I like the model of you know every four years we elect a new you know a new president or in Canada we get a new prime minister that fundamentally lines up with the way things seem to ought to be but it's, it, there, there's two there's something there's people who have figured out I guess how to game the system and not really ever give up sure. power because we're not really choosing to submit ourselves to that pattern of of actually totally giving up and saying I'm actually I trust that somebody else could know better than me what you right. know, what a better, better ideal might be, and I'm going to willingly submit myself to that. Will it right now? It's kind of a a power grab of oh, they're wrong, so we need to be in charge for a little while, so that we can knock them down, exactly. and then they get back over. And this this new that's what democracy is. You know, democracy with Boudin is an absurdity. You know, the idea of government goes back to the idea of religion and the idea of oh, the king is appointed by God. You know, there's this one guy in charge. He rules for cent a century, and the elites. That are connected to them keep ruling. That's the way government was always designed. You know, it's just this one group stays in charge. Keeps going. Now we just keep flipping it around and okay, now you're in charge. All right, now four years later, you guys are in charge. And things are just kind of chaotic. You know, and you said, and I agree with it totally. So we should be able to renegotiate how these how this stuff operates. In America, we go by shit that was written in the 1700s still. Because we're not allowed to renegotiate it. Our founding fathers wrote the right. Second Amendment. You read it this way about the guns. It has to be this way. Yeah. Why does it have to be that way? Why can't we renegotiate things? We're yeah. not allowed to. You, these guys know what's best for you. They yeah. were alive 200 years, 250 years ago. Listen to them. It's just another religion. It's just you do what's told. Believe and obey. Okay? I mean, that's what's required of you. There's no, I agree that we should be negotiating things. That's what I am. That's what anarchy is: is allowing the individual to negotiate. But that's it's, not allowed right now. Negotiation isn't an individual thing, though. It's it's a communal thing. It's just that there need to be real communities of individuals that be, are exactly that's what willing to be part of communities. But a, a community is just. A, I, community. I I would think of a community as sort of just a little a little government, though. Again, it's as soon as sure, but like i said before there has to be a balance you have to have the totally. community's okay. death yeah. if it's everything so if you have property there is a balance there god yeah. is doing that constantly it's a form of dialectic which is seeing okay here's community you have to find what's opposite of it what is opposite but still connected the individual is connected to the community therefore mm -hmm. when we approach the problem we have to approach both individual and community this is actually, it's pulled right from Christianity. I mean, it, it, dialectical thinking. I mean, I think like Thomas Aquinas was big into it. Okay. It's, Isn't the, is the guy who coined that word dialectic, is that uh, Hagel or, or is he? Hagel? I don't know if he I think he's associated with that anyways, right? But. Hagel, okay, so, how do I, you know, dialectics go back to ancient Greece. Okay, so never um, mind then. <laughs> they, yeah, I don't know the exact term. But then, yeah, it became associated with theology for a long time, a thousand some odd years. Then Kant was the big one to pull it out of theology. But it okay. still wasn't. Hegel was the big one to take it and be like, this is what dialectics is. Mm, okay. Things are connected, you know. He's at least the I, one who, is it, who ma ma made it a big deal again. Exactly. You know, being and not being. Yeah. <laughs> and somewhere. So. If I understand, I mean, I watched just even 
to have a, a basic definition of, of dialectic. I think I watched some YouTube video on, on Hegel or, or dialectics. I forget even what the topic of it was, but it was like something along the idea of a um, back and forth of a conversation, descending and ascending into different positions until you kind of approach something that's between the two, that's, that's, that's more true. Perspective taking. The thing about Hegel is that he's probably the most worst writer on the planet. Like, even in his day, <laughs> even in his day, like, people were like, I don't understand it. Like, it's very difficult to understand. Today, oh, my God, nobody understands what the guy was saying. But, yeah, if you go back to what dialectics are, it's been so confused because the Soviet Union forced dialectics on people. Um, dialectical thinking is exactly what you're it's the reciprocity of perspectives, they call it. It's, right. Okay, I'm over here, you're over here. How There's actually a common ground, but it doesn't look like there's common ground. How can we find it? Well, the only way we find it is my point, your point. We try, but it has to be civil. If people yeah, are like what, What's to the difference view, between that and the crazy game that we see playing out between the, the like the right and the left right now in the states like what why yeah, isn't that a dialectic because it really doesn't seem like one it seems like it's a it's a it's a it's a rather than a you know a back and forth uh, approaching something it's a back and forth more and more violently rocking every single time right sure yeah it's because there's no there's no trust with either side you know there has to be good mm. faith for a civil discussion to happen in america it's like borderline civil war i mean they hate each other democrats and republicans both sides want to like kill each other i mean it's not civil both sides are totally attached to their views not willing to let go an ounce or even conceive one little view to the other side right so there's no common ground right now between democrats and republicans because there's no reciprocity of perspectives there's no there's no respect for the other side you know there has to be that to occur a dialectic a true dialectical conversation it has to be civil you know it has to be respect for one another mm. there has to be otherwise it's just like i'm smarter than you idiot like you know shut up <laughs> listen to me you know it's paternalistic again you know i know what's best for you well to me it seems that that even a good faith conversation does assume an amount of i know what's best for you but it also says you might know what's best for me maybe exactly. there's there's something that neither of us is aware of that would be best for both of us and I, we both might have a piece of it, and so let's try to. I know I, I recently was working on trying to write a little bit of a uh, an essay or a blog post or something. I don't know. I, I haven't written really anything since since high school, and then a little bit in, <laughs> in, in, in Bible college. And it was like none of that really challenged me to try to flesh out my ideas. So I just kind of decided recently, okay, I got to figure out how to write again. I, this is a a really important. Ta skill that I have just neglected to develop. So I tried to start writing something, and I, and I had a friend kind of help me edit it a little bit, but I, I wrote this um, paper uh, about metaphysical trigonometry, which is just a silly theoretical concept that I, I was coming up with. But I was thinking about the idea of in order to perceive depth, your eyes have to submit their images of the world to each other, right? Neither of them can see in 3D. And it's literally a, 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 it's almost like you could think of it as a good faith conversation between your eyes that says you actually, your perspective might be seeing something meaningful about the, about the world that we're looking at. Our stories, they, they actually, they see into another dimension of truth, which is the amazing thing to think about is when, when you follow that analogy down to like, that might be what's possible when we are willing to have a good faith conversation between each other. Exactly. Is I agree totally. We could see into a new dimension of truth about reality. Proudhon, I keep going back to him, he's arguing that there's actually a collective being. Hmm. That if we as individuals open up ourselves to each other and have this kind of good faith interaction with people, it actually would harmonize itself become this beautiful society it's like i said like the book of it's it's you know the end of times fulfilled you know i mean it's, it's utopian in that way you know because it is kind of this christian theme hmm. of heaven on earth kind of mentality yeah i mean if for prudhomme that's the root of it all is people fucking think they know what's best for everybody and they hate each other and you know there's no this good faith you know 
interested in other people. It's all about no, you know, how do I live forever? You know, like that guy, you know, like what? Well, well, um, go ahead. It, well, I guess I, the the only thing I want to push back on. And, and maybe it's still not pushback. It's just every time you're talking, it seems like I need to push back here, but may, maybe I'm still just kind of not quite uh, understanding what you're saying. But like it, it, I, I, it feels like you want to reject any sort of confidence about knowledge, what might be best for it, for everybody. Like, I, I think that's really important. I, I think you need to sort of be courageous and you need to have, I, I you need to have a certain conviction that you might actually have a little bit of an understanding about what might be best for everybody that somebody else doesn't have and that it would be worthwhile you trying to no, advance that perspective on the world. I agree with you a hundred percent. That needs to still be there. But at the same time, you said it before, there also needs to be, Oh, I might be wrong. Okay. You have to leave that open. Right. Right now, people do not leave that open. I know it's best for you. Okay, shut up, idiot Republican. You're mm -hmm. a moron. Okay. You deserve to be in prison. There's no, you might be right. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's only I'm right. You're a moron is what it is. Okay. There I'm not saying that people aren't right and people have better ideas than other people. No, that's true. There are people who have better ideas than right. you. You know, there's no question. The individual needs to be able to decide that. The way to decide that is really only for people to trust other people, to have this kind of good faith relationship with other people, which does not exist right now. I mean, it does in small groups, certain communities. As a society, I don't think anybody's willing to say that that exists. I mean, it is toxic. I mean, at least in America. Yeah. I don't know about Canada. <laughs> well, do you see any way forward out of this? Like, to me, it seems like it might be possible to work towards the end of having a more, um, a more integrated connection from the bottom to the top of society. If we, like, like again, I, I think part of the, the problem or part of what may have led us where we're at is kind of hyper fixating on the superhero version of the story rather than, you know, beginning with the world that we have the most powerful power over again, not to not to subvert that. Like, I, again, I, I'm I'm a, a staunch religious person. I, I believe that that it's important to have an understanding of, of the of the gods and, and ultimately of the God, the one who you know is the highest ideal and the highest, you know, sure. infinitely uncomprehensible version of, of ideals and of morality. I think that's so, really important, but I mean, you're kind of already on that anarchist path, okay? <laughs> which is, which is I mean, what it really is. What Perdon's really arguing is for the person to embrace life, take it by the horns. Okay. And be like, I'm alive. Okay. Not, I'm going to go home, turn on Jersey shore and eat potato chips. Okay. Which is what most people in America, at least that's the dream is to do nothing. Okay. Is to fucking sit on your ass. Not think. People don't want to think either. Yeah. It's like no. I mean, if Don is saying it's for the person to start thinking and to start saying like, I want to learn. I want to know yeah. what's going on. I want to take control of my life. I want to, and that's where that's the total control for Don is work. I mean, mm -hmm. work to him is the most beautiful aspect of a person, and is really what society cares most about is your labor. I mean, right now you're laboring. I mean, you are doing an interview. This is what Pradhan would call is not alienated labor. I mean, you're doing exactly what he says is you are from your own gut saying, I want to do this. You're going out and doing it. You know how rare that is? Like very rare. I mean, but the internet has made that much more possible, you know? Right. So I see certain trends that are up, particularly in younger folk. I see, oh, maybe there's some optimism here. But then there's totally loads of these people who are just like, oh, Trump, he's going to fix it all. You know, like, right. it's like, no, that's the wrong approach. OK. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you said start thinking. And to me, I, I would follow that narrative. It's OK. So, so thinking is an act of even allowing the different parts of your brain to submit to one another. And, and perception is the act of allowing your eyes to submit to one another. And so to continue that story, so start submitting to one another go start being in relationships with people around you and building little governments there and and submitting yourselves to those and allowing them to to, to grow and reestablish themselves and and go and be part of your family and and build a strong relationship with your family build a strong relationship from there with your community and then maybe with your yeah. wider community and then maybe if we could get to the place where we're mature enough we can actually 
that ex- we might extend all the way up into having a healthy a healthy country again but it's probably going to have to again I, like I, I think that the anarchy thing is is more of like a stepping stone towards a healthier system of government and of state and of and of like you're right. not going to get around force because okay so with with force Houdan is saying instead of force being the ultimate like on on top of everything it needs to know that goes down and justice now takes that place and justice can be backed by force if i see someone you know doing something messed up i can go fucking grab them and others around me can come grab them and force mm-hmm. them to do whatever I mean, not whatever but you know apprehend them mm-hmm. force is necessary in some degree as long as justice is the guy as yeah. long as there is positive as long as it's upholding human dignity it's okay you know to use force so force it's it's a big thing with Proudhon is everything is is two you know everything is there's a dialectic there it's mm-hmm. true and not true at the same time right you know it's <laughs> there's no force but at the same time yeah there is some force there right so it's not he's not saying that no force ever no it's not totally utopian he's saying force justice just needs to be what is above everybody instead of right now which is coercion force and also Proudhon, what you're saying about the conscience about individual everything getting good and everybody opening up to each other and stuff that requires a conscience and that requires a conscience to grow and like we were talking about earlier is the conscience also is taking in information from around it from mm-hmm. society Proudhon's saying the way that it's organized right now is totally immoral i mean it's totally you suck you know you're homeless you can bum you know you deserve to be homeless you know i don't care about you it's it's an immoral society and so that our conscience is sucking this up this kind of toxicness that so people are not moral the vast majority of people are not good people because they that's what society's telling them is it's all about you show everybody how you can be successful you know show you know it's like a peacock thing where you show off your tail feathers you know like ooh, look at him he's did it this cult of the individual you know good man there's there's i want to try and can, can you yes get somewhere we can kind of sum this up a little bit so the great we we're moralizing we're we're <laughs> it's it's fundamentally a rejection of responsibility for 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 trying to understand ethics and, and morality is like we we need to stop throwing all the weight of um of of struggling with what it means to be human and what it means to be doing the right thing stop throwing all that weight on another system and, t- and take our appropriate amount of responsibility for that is that yeah that's it that's where we're at nobody <laughs> wants to do that though nobody wants to do that everybody wants I, to think i didn't even vote this guy in i, I think the there are are some movements of people who want to do that because i think we're kind of starving for a sense of meaning in life and as soon as somebody i feel like as soon as soon as somebody mature and grown up told me to take responsibility for my life as an adult and and kind of explained what that implied which i mean that's essentially it sounds like that's what you're talking about with the primacy of the individual thing like the whole proud of philosophy is is that taking responsibility for <laughs> for growing up for taking responsibility for your own life and and, and for your own actions and and, and that sort of yeah. thing and it's totally it and that's the, the sum of the message and i want to do that <laughs> you are doing it just by the fact that you're interviewing people for 100 views or so i mean that is <laughs> it i mean you're not being paid by some company to go and do interviews to celebrities no you're someone who's interested in being driven by yourself you know that is it should be all about you know but if you look around that's not what most people are doing you know those people are just like uh okay jesus is my savior i'm going to heaven when i die like let's let me go whatever i do you know i don't know people just be surprised at how people just waste their lives just I've seen it left and right. I mean, people well, just can, can we maybe let's. I think this might be a good way to kind of wrap things up. How 
how can you personally like i mean it's easy to kind of look at the world and and see how how everyone is falling prey to this this i mean and, and admittedly it's a really you get a lot of bang for your buck rejecting all of your uh, re rejecting all of your responsibility and throwing it at somebody else because suddenly you get all the benefits of whatever they do and anything they do wrong you can blame it on them but what you know studying this how has it personally changed the way you live your life yeah i mean the key to it all is to take one second <clears throat> I mean, key is to be able to work for yourself, you know, to be able to do what you want to do. I think at the end of it all, really as an individual, what you want to be doing is to take your life into your own hands. Like I said before, of your life, I mean, is really where most of your energy is going towards, is your work. And if your work is not something that you, if you're just doing just to get by, that's not it. You're doing work because you're being driven to work. And it's something that you want to do. And it's something you see value in. You know, and it's not just about becoming rich or whatever. That's what it's about. It's about finding something in life you want to do, doing it. You know, that vast majority of people don't do that. They give up. They say, okay, I'm just going to find someone to hire me, do what they tell me. Uh, I get retirement and then I'll check out, you know, go to heaven. Like, no, that's me. For me, you know, I'm in grad school now. I've finished PhDs, take it forever. Um, wow. It has, you finished, you, you have a PhD now. I'm about to, I mean, I'm doing it. I'm in the, I have to finish the experiment I'm doing. Um, okay. Man, that's, I should be done in the fall. That's incredible, though, man. Congratulations for, for pushing through to get to that point. But for me, it, it has really driven me to want to learn. I mean, to be like, well, don't know things. I look around when I was a kid, and I thought, everybody knows what's going on. Like, there's nothing for me to do. As I've gotten older, I realized people don't know shit. People are just going about their lives thinking that someone above them knows what's going on. No, they don't. People don't know what's going on. And when people and people just pass around the buck, like, oh, okay, it's not my fault. This guy's this person's fault. No, you're actually connected to it. Okay. Your shirt price from made in China. Okay. You just <laughs> you just want to act like you're not connected. Okay. We all do that. We want to act like we're some hero. It's like, no, we're connected to this shithole where things suck. Okay. And we're part of this. And you want to take control of your life and start rejecting it. You can't just overnight be like, okay, I'm done with it. No, it's not how it works. You have to slowly orient yourself away from it and start building something. For me, it's about building something. I think that's the key phrase, is to actually use your life to build something meaningful that you see as meaningful. Mm. I see, I mean, a lot of people would just, they chase money. They don't chase meaning. They chase, oh, I want to get a shiny new car, you know, and so I'm just going to get a lot of money. It's meaningless waste of your life, you know? You want something to make out of your life. That's how I'd sum it up. That's good, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking a little while to sit down and chat with me about this stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it. This is cool that you're doing this. Like I said, that's great, man. This is doing it. This is a fun time, man. And I feel like I definitely have... A, I've I've gleaned something from this, and even having this this story of of all these different all these different political philosophers and stuff kind of interacting with each other, and and it, it's it's always fun to kind of expand that understanding of of the conversation that's taken place to get where we are, and 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 exactly. maybe the rest of the world, world can move forward. World's an incredible place. So much yeah. has happened, you know. It's just there's so much going on all the time. There's so many people. I mean, you can't even understand how many people are out there. It's just, and so many people are just not interested in it. No, you're clearly interested in it. I'm interested in it. And that's what it's all about to me. You know, that's the beauty of the world. People who are interested in it. Well, let's you know? keep let's keep being interested in it. And let's, let's pursue some meaning. <laughs> let's do it. All right, man. All right, bud. It was nice talking to you, man. You too. Well, that was interesting. 
If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to subscribe, like the video. Any kind of engagement really helps out with algorithm stuff as far as I'm aware. Another thing I'd love if you would do would be to share this video with someone who you think might find it interesting or specifically might disagree with it about something or disagree with you about something and use it as a launch pad to have an interesting conversation, have an interesting disagreement maybe, because that's really what this whole thing is about for me. I think that having, you know, honest disagreements is a really useful and meaningful thing to do. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.